you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here. Uh, and thank you, API Days team, for hosting, uh, hello, giving us the opportunity to host this session. And I thank uh, Jitin uh, Bandari from uh, Nokia to be here on the session, and uh, Ram, uh, Niranjan Ramaswamy, we call him dearly Ram, uh, to be on this session. Thank you for joining us. Uh, let me begin with a, a quick introduction of uh, Digital API Craft. Um, uh, I know we're on the last session, guys, so we'll keep it interesting. We have a lot of interesting topics to talk about today. Uh, we'll go over a little intro about uh, who we are, uh, who is Digital API Craft, uh, what we do, uh, a little bit uh, a quick intro about our products, and then we'll go on an intro with uh, Nokia and then with Pfizer. Yep. Uh, let me start with the first. So um, my name is Bharat Kumar. I'm the founder and CEO of Digital API Craft. So we, uh, we are a leading product and uh, SaaS company in the API and engineering space. So we're solving some of the uh, challenges, the problems uh, that are out today, uh, uh, particularly in the whole uh, API strategy. Uh, so uh, before, prior, uh, prior to uh, studying DAC, uh, we worked with Apigee, and, uh, which is a Google product now. Uh, we've been uh, in the business since uh, seven years, and since then we've worked with uh, close to 50 plus enterprises, uh, 15 plus financial uh, banking customers on various uh, uh, capacities, uh, 10 plus telcos. Uh, we've built close to 50 plus uh, uh, marketplaces, uh, sorry, 40 plus marketplaces uh, for various industries. Uh, and also, we've built some of the most uh, monetized, complex monetization model uh, out there. Um, we're also present in uh, uh, three locations, uh, India, US, and UK. So we are also a premier partner uh, uh, to GCP. We have a very close relationship with GCP. Uh, given our background with uh, Apigee. And uh, yeah, so these are some of the credentials. And also, uh, we have a very specific uh, tailored solution for banking and uh, healthcare. So in healthcare, we collaborated and uh, developed a solution uh, on a complete fire-based spec, uh, which is a compliance for the healthcare uh, payers and providers out there. Uh, we also have a very regulatory-focused solution for different regulatory markets. Uh, 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 as we know, most uh, open banking is kind of you know, getting you know, uh, uh, become, becoming regulation, you know, starting to start from uh, UK, Europe. Uh, Bahrain, for example, follows uh, UK spec. So we have a, a framework you know, that kind of you know, allows us to build the uh, regulatory solutions to different markets. So this is who we are. Uh, quick uh, introduction about uh, products. Um, so uh, the key flagship product is one API marketplace. One API marketplace is a, a platform agnostic uh, API marketplace. So uh, it, it comes with a, a key USP called uh, connector, connector Framework. That means you know, we have built a, a connector framework to different API uh, gateway, API platform companies, starting from Apigee to MuleSoft to Kong, Azure. So name an API platform, we, 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 will, we will be able to spin it up and uh, connect to your any API gateway. Uh, so we have seen uh, stories you know, moving from, uh, customers uh, moving from uh, one API platform to another. another you know, uh, uh, this has become a commodity now, API platform. So this is where you know, we have, uh, our, uh, our strategy is to, keep, to remain platform agnostic and provide a consistent developer experience no matter how enterprises are moving uh, from uh, gateway, multi-gateway, uh, multi-cloud API deployment. Uh, so Open API Sandbox is an extension of uh, API Marketplace, so where a developer will get more, much more than a virtualization uh, layer where they can get to test their APIs, the enterprise APIs, uh, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a transactional level, right? So if you go to any enterprise today, you know, spinning up a database, spinning up a, spinning up a sandbox, you know, takes a lot of effort, right? So that's where we come in, uh, take some of the specification and spin it up with, uh, with our framework, uh, create three-layered approach where create an API layer, create a microservice layer, and create a data model. So with microservice, you can inject rules and add rules, so make it more transactional. So that way, developer gets more in-depth uh, 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 more, more deeper level testing, you know, with the uh, uh, market with the sandbox. One API hub is essentially an internal portal, which brings all of the the, the factory APIs from different groups uh, into one single platform, where the, the, we saw with the discoverability, adaptability, and also reducing the you know the redundant API development, right? So if you look at you know last pre-pandemic, right? So most enterprises were on a, on building APIs, like thousands of APIs, right? Uh, go back like six, seven years, you know, the adopting API strategy, adopting and building an API platform was a, was a key strategy. And then they went on to build uh, thousands of APIs. And then, you know, okay, look, let's take a step back. What are we doing here, right? So we need to consolidate. So every CIO, you know, uh, is looking at consolidation of APIs, you know, and also creating the marketplace, you know, for that, right? Uh, so DAC Innovation Lab is a unique product. So uh, if you look at enterprises, 
Uh, today, the, the third parties are coming really faster, right? And they want to uh, innovate with the uh, uh, enterprises. They want to co-innovate, they want to build brand new set of services via APIs, and they want to eventually publish it, certify it with enterprises. And they want to also you know, commercialize on a revenue sharing model. So uh, DAC Dapper and DAC API Studio is again, uh, API Studio starting from scratch for somebody product manager to build APIs collaboratively with API architects, developers, and product managers to develop a brand new spec. And also a Dapper is a, a new rendering uh, uh, a tool you know, uh, that we are actually raising you know, on this uh, platform. So these are the th uh, key essential products. So now why we're solving this, these products or on the out on the market uh, is essentially to fill the gap. Uh, so I just want to go back like 10 years. You know, if you look at the uh, API landscape, uh, we had uh, uh, enterprises, you know, if I go back Apigee days, right? So we had enterprises building their own uh, homegrown gateways. You know, we have seen they were even challenging, you know, why do, I need, why do we need to use API gateways? Now, today, like fast forward 20, 2022, every enterprise you know, uh, uses the API platform. So it's no big deal. There's no uh, 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 challenge in that. They understand this is an essential layer to their uh, whole be. Uh and, and again, so the API strategy is to, uh, to, to cater to all the developer platform, right? So not just having a platform that just solves a, a API runtime. So you need to build a lot of elements like API marketplace. Uh, bring a developer experience, you know, by uh, by by by, create, by providing a transaction sandbox, and also eventually, you know, give him uh, give the proper monetization, a seamless experience, and then eventually the natural progress progression for enterprises is to build app studio, app marketplace kind of experiences. So this is the future, you know, what's the what the marketplace, what the enterprise are moving, to even building uh, the new set of uh, experiences for third parties, and these third parties is actually uh, are coming up really faster. Uh, the uh, they are coming up you know, to enterprises asking for data, and a lot of enterprises are, you know, are actually working offline to onboard them. So the API marketplace with uh, much more, they need a more complex monetization, commercialization engine uh, that can go into the marketplace, which can, which can actually enable them to seamlessly you know, grow the third-party ecosystem. So with that, you know, this is our product. So uh, uh, what we want to end it uh, with a quick uh, uh, testimony from a customer and what they came back and said as, uh, hey, guys, thank you. Uh, thank you for building you know, uh, the API marketplace for us in a time that you guys committed. The time you guys committed is three months, you know, which, is, uh, which took us like uh, three months to solve it. Uh, so with that, I just want to end my quick, quick introduction, and I will like to pass it on to uh, uh, Ram. OK. So good evening, good afternoon. Uh, long day, but hopefully everyone had a good day. <laughs> um, so I work for Fiserv. And uh, our CEO used to be actually lo located on the 29th floor of this building. So I'm very familiar with this building. We just recently moved to one Broadway. So that's where we're located. And so what is Fiserv? We're one of the largest fintechs in the world. And we like to think of ourselves as one of the original fintechs, right? We have a vast array of banking and payment capabilities uh, to serve banks, credit unions, merchants, brands, governments, and also other fintechs. So here are some stats in case you've not heard of us. Um, and uh, we can do that because we have many, many products. Uh, just in this audience, um, if you all pay your bills online, uh, you're probably using a Fiserv product. Um, if you turn over your debit card and you see something called Star Network or Axel Network on the back of it, you're running through one of our, one of our networks, right? Uh, the other thing we have is, uh, obviously, you can see up here, one in three U.S. banks, you know, we power them. Uh, and we've got over 150 million uh, people that have their accounts in our products. So uh, we have a, a lot of access to financial data uh, because we touch practically every U.S. household. And we'll be touching a lot of your uh, financials as well. It just you may not know it. Uh, and so what that does is gives us access to data to help and we protect that data, we're a regulated industry, uh, but to create very personalized touch points and experiences, right? And so for me, as the general manager of the Embedded FinTech division, it helps me uh, influence this, this movement called open finance. It should be called open banking. It started in the UK. I think they've already discussed that over here. And, uh, and, the, and the essence of open finance is really uh, a movement where you don't need to go to a bank to do your banking. The bank needs to come to you, and you should be able to access your bank from wherever you, you can and what, you know, in whatever you're doing, right? And the bedrock of that 
is what this conference is about, about a whole API ecosystem. So looking forward to sharing our insights with you. And I'm thrilled to be here with Jitin from Nokia. Yeah. So then you would, like, would you like to go next and I'll give an introduction about Nokia? Absolutely. I mean, a lot of people are thinking, what the hell Nokia is doing out here? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> 5G communications and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, I promise, you know, I know bet I'm between you and drinks. Uh, let's make it quick. Uh, many of you know we are embarking on the 1.0 journey of 5G. And, uh, you know, the whole communication industry as a whole, and Nokia in itself, is going through a humongous, huge transformation. And the way the way we know our networks are going to change forever. And, and one of the biggest, largest piece of the problem solving today we are doing is around the programmable persona of the network, what we call as the stream of network monetization and, and actually bringing a concept what we call as network as code. Um, you know, I'll take you to a bit history uh, just very quickly in a minute. You know, 10 years back, 12 years back when the telcos were busy, busy building 4G networks and two important vectors came out, data and mobility. And uh, till date, the CSPs and vendors like us uh, have a bad taste in our mouth that we were relegated as connected players where OTT took the cake. And one of the biggest challenge back then for the communication industry was that we were never able to build up a programmable persona of the network. So this time around, um, what I'm showing you out here in the chart we have realized that you know the 5G is a very very powerful ecosystem, and I'll talk about it. You know why 5G is a powerful ecosystem. What are the value vectors, and what is beyond voice and video and messaging that we could monetize on? So the programmable persona of the network as a 5G has become a critical component. Take an example, case point: Uber. Uber thrives on distributed service chains, uses SendGrid, AWS, Twilio, and a bunch of players to stitch together a service. What we, you and I, use it every day, but guess what? They're running on an, a network, a mobile network, and the CSPs are never part of that distributed value chain, and now we're able to monetize it. So this is a piece that we are coming back to and bringing this topic on front and center, hopefully with, with my colleague out here in RAM on the, on the banking side, on the financial side, and on the communication side, two horizontals out here will make join this conversation more interesting as how do we convert together and make more monetizable use cases in a more programmable persona. Back to you, Bharat. Yeah, thank you, Jitin and Ram, for that uh, quick introduction. So I'm going to move on, and I said, and I'm going to be asking questions about uh, the developer experience in our ecosystem. Let me stay with you, Jitin. You know, tell us about uh, the whole eco API ecosystem, the strategy that's driving. You know, what's driving within Nokia? That's a that's an interesting question, and maybe we can use this visual chart for our audience out here. This is this is where the state of the affairs of the networks is going on, and and actually, you know. We at Nokia build about 80 plus workloads and applications that spread around radio routing and large part of data voice networks as well as operations and analytics and many use cases, which fires up you know, AT&Ts and Verizons and BTs of the world. We have about 350 plus customers. But what's happening out there is, is as you know it, uh, you know, today a large part of the 5G ecosystem is software centric and, and cloud native in nature. So what we call is there is already a transformation of what we call a digital fabric is that has been built in and most of these workloads and applications are running on public cloud. In fact, you know, we announced a, a, a new launch of Dish Network of 5G with Nokia where which was running on completely a public cloud operator, AWS. So we are operating now in a 5G, a 5.9 reliable, highly reliable reliable network all, all real time. And what's happening out here is the promise of 5G is all about crossing that B2B2 bridge. How do you create a more monetizable network? And that gets to the point of how do you create a more programmable persona and how do you make the abstractability of this network simple and effective enough to that developer ecosystem that that actually latches to this metaverses of Web 3.0 ecosystem or the industrial metaverse and the consumer metaverse. And that's, that's all it is about. How do you participate in that distributed service chain? And that's what we have been thinking about. So if this, this diagram actually illustrates that the ecosystem of applications, we believe, from a 5G standpoint, not only caters to the consumer side of it, but also to the industrial metaverse and the OT applications and the Web 3.0 applications. So the developers at large are going to be humongous for us. Yeah. It's all about how do we simplify the persona of the network. Yeah. So I think I can see you know, the, the actually the, the Nokia is actually moving from another you know, network, you know, from the traditional network as a network as a service. 
and how is it going to be, you know, as you said, there's a lot of programmability coming out you know, uh, from the network. And how's the developer experience that you see in your eyes uh, is important because you're, you're building a set of uh, new set of services for developers. Developers are becoming your new customers, right, as we chatted about. And how is it going to be, uh, how much important uh, the developer experience is going to be? You know, it's, it's, it's going to be paramount if you're attacking to a 19-year-old or a 23-year-old developer. And, and, you know, we did a very interesting experiment yeah. very recently in Finland. Um, there's an operator, Eliza, and, yeah. and, and we took a stadium. Um, it's a hockey, ice hockey stadium that hosts World Games. And what we did, we, we did 360-degree cameras all around in the stadium. And the stadium is powered with 5G mid-wave ecosystems, yeah. high bandwidths, and so on and so forth. And we had AR, VR systems yeah. and 360 degree cameras everywhere. Yeah. And if you are in the stadium or just a few miles outside the stadium, mm -hmm. because we are able to do a programmable person of all these endpoints and devices, and we have started to call that it's the death of the smartphone, because the amount of endpoints and devices that will be connected to the new age network is going right. to be humongous. Yeah. How do you approach now a developer who's building up an application on an AR, VR handset yeah. and be able to on-demand use the network bandwidth? So okay. what we are able to now do is with these AR, VR handsets, you can actually wear them. You could be in the stadium or outside the stadium, yeah. but you could be experiencing the game from the perspective of a goalie. Yeah. You could be in the middle of the stadium. Yeah. You could be anywhere and experiencing the ice hockey game right there. Yeah. I'm not carrying my AR VR set right now. I could give you a demo of it, and, and that's, that's only by the power of the programmable persona. Exactly. We've turned a stadium yeah. into a programmable platform. Yeah. And obviously, you know, my friend Ram here can take some of these APIs and monetize on it and make the financial right. banking <laughs> complement of it. But, but that's, that's the excitement of connectivity and banking. That's what's going on out there. So yeah. we have to realize and embrace this innovation. Uh, and the only way to, I can think of it, is through the programmable persona of the network. Yeah, uh, wonderful. That's yeah. how it is. Yeah, that, that's amazing. Yeah, actually, uh, you know, to his point, um, you know, if you, a lot of you have used ATMs, right? And the next generation of ATMs is intelligent telemachines. You might have seen these kiosks in hotel lobbies, subway stations. You know, just next time take a look around, and it's, it's an ATM on steroids. So that's connected to our same um, ecosystem of networks, but it gives you a very enriched experience. You can do video chat, right? So you know, the, if the bank closes at the branch closes at five o'clock, you can go home. But if you want to interact with an ATM, you can still talk to a teller virtually over there, right? And so if you take a look at that experience, it requires a lot of Broadband, a lot of a lot of uh, data has to be downloaded there to be enriching the experience because they're on Wi-Fi, they're not connected through anything, anything yeah. through a wire. Yeah. So when you get to that, there's a lot of cross pollination between the financial experiences we generate, whether it be on an ITM, a mobile device, or even an IoT, you know, wearable, and 5G. So that's you know that's an industry we're also very closely kind of watching because it, uh, at the end of the day, it helps us enrich what we bring to the table, right? Yeah. Yeah, thank you, thank you for the response. So I'm going to ask you know, the same question, you know, the developer experience ecosystem. Yeah. Tell us about the Pfizer's vision uh, creating the third party ecosystem. Yeah, so yeah. you know, we have hundreds of products and consequently thousands of APIs. And I think we've made a lot of technology companies happy. We have every ESB on the face of the earth, um, every gateway on the face of the earth, everything exists. You know, tell me a technology and we have it. Um, and so it causes some, some disruption, some chaos within our company. But at the end of the day, you know, when you look at the developer experience, it has to drive faster time to market, right? It has to be clean and crisp. And the example I give my technology team is, you know, uh, many moons ago when I wanted to buy a car, I would go to a car dealership and sit there for six hours and fill out uh, 50 pages of uh, paper and, and then do some financing and maybe walk out of there with a car. But today I can do it in 10 minutes in Carvana and the car shows up at my desktop, right? At my house, excuse me. So the developer experience has to be as seamless as that. You know, you have to make it as easy for a developer to, uh, to see and, and understand and, and, and experience an API as easy as it is as ordering a pizza. If you make it any more difficult, then they're not going to be able to do what they came there to do. Mm -hmm. The second thing is, you know, you've got to lower the barrier of entry, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you can't make it too expensive for a developer to come to your developer.com and, mm -hmm. and figure out what to do, you know, because they're trying to build software. And yeah. the staying on the car example, the other thing I give is, you know, today I can go to Tesla.com and buy a $50,000 car or even a $100,000 car by putting $100 on my credit card mm -hmm. and be on my way, right? So uh, you don't have to do You have to think twice. Five clicks and you're on your way. So you have to lower the barrier of entry for anybody that, and the re for the reason you put it out there is to invite folks to work with you. So you, you got to not make that a huge, uh, make it re resistive for them to start to work with you. And the third is from a Pfizer perspective, uh, we want to we recruit talent. So we want to show them what we have. <laughs> and when you open it up, 
there are so many, so many intelligent people out there that will think about things that we haven't thought about. Yes. And maybe when they think about that, they want to come and work for us. But the only way that starts is by showing them what you have. So, uh, you know, that's how we think about our developer experience. And then, obviously, we have an app store and an app market for our banks so they can come there. And so when you build your software, you know, you can, you can showcase it on our app market as well. And, and uh, as you can see, we've got credit, credit platforms, debit platforms, virtual account platforms, international platforms as well. And then a lot of security, like, I know, anti-money laundering. And so there's a lot of, you know, we're, we've got compliance laws that govern us. And so there's a lot of intense uh, security that goes on uh, as well. So that's how we sort of think of putting all of that you know, on a, on a, for a developer experience. So uh, I see the tab, Developer Studio, and then uh, App Market and third-party integrations, right? So, uh, so do you see other enterprises playing a similar game, like uh, creating their own App Marketplace, or because the Fiserv is capable of you know, uh, having such a you know, big uh, client base of uh, friends? Yeah, so you know, in our um, industry, um, so if you just step back, so, so short answer is yes, but it's fintechs and banks. Yeah. Right, yeah. because uh, with open what open banking did is it opened up a whole generation of fintechs that probably wouldn't have existed, yeah. you know, until they opened it up over there in the over there in the EU, right? And what fintechs started to do is they the first strategy was to disintermediate banks, right? Mm -hmm. So if you look at um, a Revolut or a Chime, you don't even know the name of the bank that there's actually a bank underneath Correct. the hood of that, right? Yeah. But you don't know that. So in that case, you know, the bank sort of loses their brand, they lose their customers, and that's sort of prevalent over here. Yeah. And then. I think I have a slide. So what starts to happen is a lot of these banks start to lose their assets. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so if you can put up the one slide on the on the balance sheet, yeah. uh, do you have that on yeah. there? Yeah. Sure. So what happens is when the banks lose those customers, you know they, they kind of go away from there. Um, so this is an example of, you know, we go to banks and say, you know, do you understand where you're losing your assets to, right? Uh, whether it be to a crypto company or a payment company. So then banks start to say, hey, how about can we actually offer this? instead of us losing these customers. So they need to open themselves up as well. Correct. So we find ourselves in the middle of this collaboration, right? APIs yeah. for banks, APIs for fintechs, to yeah. kind of hook to each other. Right. And uh, a, go a good example of that, uh, not to take too much time, I know we're running short, is um, August 31st, the student loan moratorium in this country ends. So people got a bypass, you know, a freebie, uh, and didn't have to pay student loans starting in the beginning of the pandemic. So if you were to had a student loan, you didn't have to pay any money, but that that free ride ends on August 31st. And Jitin here just told me that the Fed increased the rates by 0.75%. So the student loan interest rates have gone up. So people that didn't pay any money for their student loans, they're going to have to start paying 500,000 bucks a month, starting yeah. starting you know, on the other side of August 31st. Yeah. So if you look at it now, internet searches for student loan debt, how to manage that has gone up 5,000%. Yeah. So we have apps that help people manage their student loans, yeah. like Candidly and Future Fuel on our app market, right. that banks are providing. Yeah. So that's a way, now how did that happen? That FinTech opened up its APIs, mm -hmm. the bank opened up its APIs, and we're in the middle and encouraging that collaboration yeah. through this whole ecosystem, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's, you know, there are many examples I can go on. Yeah. But uh, if there's any questions, I can obviously... Again, I think, uh, yeah, so the question, again, uh, yeah, I think you kind of explain how the API strategy is kind of helping you know, the student loans. Uh, track them and uh, uh, again at uh, the balance uh, balance sheet transactions, which is actually helping banks. Uh, so that that's really brilliant. So I'm going to you know, flip to question to uh, Telco. Uh, ask a question about uh, how are you you know leveraging the the whole uh, uh, API based strategy you know and the and the five G you know that's coming up you know really fast. Uh, maybe you know could you give us a picture about uh, how Nokia is going to play? Yeah. yeah, no, it's it's an interesting question, and maybe you know I'll use this chart that I'm presenting out here, and it's sort of an education for everyone as well. You know what has happened is, and and I know Twilio was present downstairs, so and they are present as part of the sponsors as well. What Twilio has done in the last ten years, and the CPaaS industry as a whole, if you see, they've just done programmable three vectors, voice, video, and messaging. And through those three vectors, a whole new market, just because of the programmable persona, a $35 billion market of what we call a CPaaS was born, and, 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 and doing active business, heavily in growth, and so on and so forth. I, I present this chart for a reason that, you know, if you think about 5G, 5G is of enormous value, and I'm, I'm looking at all of these building blocks from the radios to the to the data or the packet core pieces of it to the voice pieces of it to the operations analytics. Every single building block of 5G is now cloud-native and software-centric in nature. 
And the very fact that it's design first, open API first, and cloud native design principles, even the radio stations out there are exposing proximity and location specific vectors that can give you a precise two millimeter to three millimeter precision on location and proximity. And that's something very, very important and critical for industry floors. Uh, we are big into private wireless right now, and we are turning on a lot of industry 4.0 um, uh, transformation, where conveyor belts, robotic arms, earth movers, they're all using high-speed data. And what they are specifically looking for, a three millimeter, five millimeter precision as they're moving stuff from the conveyor belts. So having that radio vector and getting that proximity and location specificity coming out in the programmable persona used by the PLC controller on that robotic arm is almost a necessity if you want to capitalize not only on the power of the network, but also want to monetize on it. So think of these all as 20 plus vectors and think of if the three vectors between voice, video and messaging could create about a $35 billion market, what could the 20 plus vectors on a network persona of a 5G could do. And this is exactly what Nokia has been thinking about is how do we expose the high end analytics of the networks, how the networks are being used, consumed, where the data bandwidths are, how they are being optimized, what's the customer experiences, how's the operations aspects of it. And not only internally for the network operators, but also taking it to the developers community to create new value. So that's, that's where it's enormous value that we are all sitting up and it's all mm -hmm. based on APIs and programmable persona. Yeah. I think I have a follow-up question for you for that. So, uh, so the, the APS, as I said, you know, is playing a key role in changing the whole landscape of the, the whole telco, right? Uh, from the pure network, uh, pure play to a network as a service, right? So how is it going to be different you know, with 5G coming in? It's coming really fast, right? And uh, as I said, the ecosystem players are also growing really fast with AR, VR applications. So how is it going to be different this time? No, you know, it's a very, very good question, uh, actually. And, uh, you know, when I talk to a lot of CTIOs, both the service provider sides, the big service providers, the small service providers, and a lot of big questions being asked, you know, what's going to be different this time around, Jidin? Because we talked about programmable persona, the network in the 4G space, and we failed miserably as a vertical. And, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm using this chart, you know, this time around, it's going to be enormously different. A, for the first time, we are rebuilding the networks in a cloud-native fashion. Everything is going on public cloud, hybrid clouds, we are talking about private clouds, adoptions of pieces of it. And, and because of that, of the cloud-native nature of the aspects, and if you pay, started paying attention, and communication is a highly regulated industry, just like banking or healthcare, what is good about communication is there are a lot of standards forum like 3GPP and TMF, which is controlling the operations and the networks part of it. And if you flip these standards or standardization body, everyone is talking about API first, design first principles. So that's, that's something enormous. If you look at the 3GPP specifications, which is the latest one coming from 5G and 5G advance, they are started to document about how the network persona in APIs would be exposed out. Mm -hmm. So that's a very encouraging sign mm -hmm. from both networks and operations API span point. Mm -hmm. The other piece of it, you know, um, communications industry as a whole has started a lot of initiative. Kamara is a very interesting project where there is a telco open API alliances that's going on really, really well. HCA started a few pieces. But what excites me most is not only the telcos and the associated service API and operations API, it's the industry verticals. Look at 5G AA. The automation industry is now talking about how do you define right set of APIs that one can use into a car and use the extreme bandwidth and low latency capabilities of 5G and make it relevant or upload a software when Tesla needs it at 3 a.m. in the morning. Yeah. Right, So things like that of nature is happening at a phenomenal speed. So if you look at this chart from bottom to top up, from the cloud infrastructure all the way to the application yeah. provider, everybody is now thinking about yeah. programmable persona and API. So it's, this has never happened in this industry yeah, about absolutely. in the last seven, eight years. <laughs> so it's very, very different and very, very different. No, it's, it's a very, very exciting time so, since you mentioned, right? So the auto car industries, so the automakers, are actually you know, will be a connected car that we're talking about, right? So BMWs are talking about charging a a uh, monthly subscription model for a heated seats, right? So uh, yeah. uh, obviously the data will gonna go uh, and uh, we need more data streams. So uh, there's a lot of converging points that you know, we could think about, right? So uh, so what other industries do you see? You know, it'll, uh, I think, yeah, I'm gonna hold that question, but uh, uh, let's, let's me hold that uh, thought for now. So uh, let me go back to uh, uh, Ram again. Uh, Ram, so uh, tell us about you know, a little bit of you know, deviating from you know, a telco. Uh, let's talk about, uh, again, um, 
the crypto industry. So uh, how, how, are, how is it affecting the fintech? You know, what kind of opportunities or threats uh, <laughs> is it present, uh, presenting to the fintech world? So it's, uh, it can't be ignored, right? So um, when you um, look at uh, crypto, I mean, it's, it's a di different digital asset right now. It's everywhere. Um, but if you just step back and understand what's trying to go on there, this is some statistics over here, right? Uh, at least in this country, 81% of us are, are crypto aware. So we know that's going on, right? And of that 81%, um, about 65% are crypto curious. So some of us, 65% have done something. We've gone and bought some. We've gone and bought a Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever. But what we find out is that 70% uh, of people will actually go a little bit further if crypto was offered from them from their bank. Right? So if, they, if, you, if, the, if your bank came to you and said, hey, and if you can hold that asset in your bank, um, you're more likely to start uh, using crypto. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and 80% of those will, will think that their bank is actually innovative if yeah. they actually do that in the first place. Right? <laughs> So, and therein lies the opportunity for banks, right? To yeah. say, okay, now how do we get in here? Well, a lot of that is going to be enabled through integration and collaboration and co-innovation through APIs and, and messaging, messaging backbones yeah. because it's gotta be fast. It's all real time. So it happens, it happens instantaneously and it's gotta be really, really fast. So uh, one of the things in this area, so that's what we're looking at, right? So it's interesting and so a lot of banks are getting in there but uh, also the user experiences here are, are much more forward in terms of the demographic of people that, that get into crypto and start to buy digital assets, right? whatever they may be. And crypto is not just currency, it can be used in other areas as well, right? right. Yeah. So one quick example, right? I mean, I see a lot of people on their phones over here, right? If I were to ask you to um, you know, pick up your phone and just swipe your thumb across the phone, yeah. you guys wanna try it? I'll try a quick experiment. If you can take your phone, right? If you can pick up your phone, I'm gonna to count to 1001, okay? That's all. And all I want you to do is like swipe your thumb across the phone, right? Ready to go? <laughs> all right, here we go. 1001, right? Let's try that one more time, okay? 1001. How many people swipe twice? <laughs> right, twice. Anybody did three times? No? I tried this at another conference and they did, and there was, a, there was somebody that did four times. Right? So if you think about that, your attention span is 500 milliseconds. Mm -hmm. If you get down below that, you know, you'll, you'll be his 5G customer. <laughs> but the point is, you have to create a UX experience that's 500 milli. You know, gone are the three seconds or five seconds you know, on the browser. Those days are long gone. It's under a second to make my point, right? So how do you capture an, that attention and keep that attention, whether you're buying and selling crypto or paying your bills online or yeah. paying your rent or paying a loan or whatever it is, right? Or you're at a Kroger and you got to, that is where this thing starts. Uh -huh. And so the backbone is you got to craft your APIs the right yeah, way. You're right. You're right. You're right. I mean, on 5G, just an FYI for everyone, <laughs> for AR, VR handsets, we are talking about 10 millisecond sub latencies. <laughs> latencies yeah. Yes, that's, that's the latencies we are talking about. This whole ecosystem of edge and edge platforms yeah. is all tied up to 10 millisecond latencies. If you want to have that immersive experience, that's mm -hmm. what we are talking. It's a point taken. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> So I, I think you know, we're going to move to our next uh, segment of questions. I think uh, so. Do we um, have time? I mean, yeah, I think you know, we're done with the <laughs> slides. So maybe I could sit down. <laughs> so uh, next set of questions is uh, really talking about how telcos uh, and uh, banks. Uh, you know, what are the new set of uh, ecosystem players that you think? You know, maybe you know, we can start with uh, uh, Ram. You know, tell us about you know uh, some examples. Yeah. So um, you know, one of the um, Markets we also serve as merchants. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot of the brands that you have, that all of you use on an everyday basis, uh, they're our clients, right? And if you take a look at merchants, um, some of the things they do is they issue credit cards, um, they have mobile payments, mm -hmm. and uh, you also have things like buy now, pay later right now, BNPL, right? Those things are also growing. And so what merchants and brands are also trying to do is take a lot of those experiences and combine them with other other experiences, for example, uh, financial literacy, right? I mentioned student loan management. Yeah. <laughs> um, I also, ESG, I don't know how many folks know what ESG is, it's environmental social governance. Mm -hmm. um, so most people associate that with climate control, but the next time you buy something or you spend some money, they might ask you, do you want to contribute something for, the, you know, for climate or for green money? And you know, computing is also taking on a new form where it's, it's green computing. Mm -hmm. um, 
many moons ago in a past life, or actually a past version of this life, you know, I used to love C++. And there's a report out there that says C is the greenest language. You all should go you know, search for that, right? It's not Python or anything. You know, that's actually pretty bad when it comes to computing power, you know? Um, so a lot of our merchants are like wanting to participate. So when you combine all of this together, um, you know, telco providers are in there as well to provide really a very cohesive ESG f in experience increasing financial literacy or reaching out to the right demographic, right? Because mm -hmm. the demographics are changing. The people that are going to be banking in front of us are not going to be banking in, in front of a 21-inch monitor or a 34-inch monitor. <laughs> They're going to be banking differently. How do you take all of that and to his point in 10 milliseconds, yeah. bring that together? That's where there's a lot of synergy taking place. I don't know if you have some yeah. thoughts on that. No, yeah. I, I, th I think, okay. you know, it, it's, it's, it goes back to, uh, I'll share some, some factual data here. You know, last year, late last year, we did a study with Gartner. Mm -hmm. And uh, behind the 5G ecosystem, uh, we looked at where the money being spent, right. actually, yeah. right? And, and it came out out of the 256 billion that will be spent in the next three to five years, Connectivity, network, infrastructure is only 29% of it. About 216 billion, or about 81% of that spend, or 71% of that spend, would be in digital applications. Digital applications, yeah. <laughs> right? So to hold on to that thought. 216 billion to be created in digital application ecosystem. The second piece of it is, you know, we talked about distributed service chains, and it's all going to be about distributed service chain. When you need it, how much you need it, and if you be able to monetize on it. Yeah. And, and those dynamic distributed service chains are going to be really fast. Yeah. And so, so, for example, we talked about consumer metaverses, and we talk about industrial metaverses, right? You should be able to consume the network on demand mm -hmm. and be able to pay, pay for it and then switch back to your normals, mm -hmm. right? We, we, do, we have done just, for Vodafone back in Europe, we did an anomaly detection. So we, what we did was we took some drones, mm -hmm. those were programmable PLC drones, mm -hmm. and uh, what we did was we fired up network APIs on on-demand bandwidth usage okay. for agriculture farming, and, and they were using anomaly detections either for their farms mm -hmm. or for their windmills, mm -hmm. and they are able to call a single API mm -hmm. to kick the bandwidth from 20 Mbps to 200 Mbps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as the anomaly detection happens, you fire the network from 20 to 200, mm -hmm. you capture the anomaly, and release back the bandwidth like back the bandwidth. to 20 Mbps. Mm -hmm. And you can only do this, and, and during that time, because the network is precious and the assets are precious, you can call Pfizer's APIs and, yeah. and have a banking and a charging monetization plane to it. Yeah. So right there is a distributed chain for us. Right. right there is a live use case. Now you can take that drone to agriculture, to a port or a mining, to, to any other use case, right? Yeah. Drone so banking. That's what's going on. Drone, right? yeah. drone banking. One of the products we have is a product called Clover. So the next time any of you are at um, a Chipotle or a Chick-fil-A, and you look at the white tablet that you're plugging your um, credit card into, take a look at what it says there. If it says Clover, that's a Pfizer product. And any small business, uh, or even, you know, so um, that whole POS, that, tab that tablet out there has got a ton of apps on it. Mm -hmm. Runs entirely on broadband, mm -hmm. um, and, and of course Wi-Fi, but broadband as well. So it's like a it's like a tablet. That's a whole small business ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So over there, that, that's dependent on what Jitin says, right? The, yeah. the more we, we get, the more enriching experience we can provide you in self checkout and, yeah. and 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 offer you a much better experience over there. Yeah, right? yeah. Just the 4G itself you now gave us so many apps and so many out many different you know, innovative applications. And still, I know the market is. People say it's just a beginning. The app market is going to be like so much uh, exciting. And but uh, with 5G coming in with a lot of uh, streaming data, we can only so imagine, right? The amount of you know, innovative applications. Do you think uh, this third-party you know players are, are matured enough to consume you know build applications now, or, or are you seeing what's a trend? You know, uh, maybe you can say that you know um, what, what's the ecosystem players that you uh, currently see, and probably how fast they're coming. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, we believe that you know the amount of applications 
that are hungry for extreme bandwidth and extreme low latency mm. are going to be enormous. And especially, mm. you know, uh, we have about 500 plus customers on the mm. private wireless space and mm. we are turning on industries into private wireless. Mm -hmm. Gone were the days when they were on our Wi-Fi systems and they are looking for private wireless just purely for asset tracking or high bandwidth or extreme low latencies. Mm -hmm. And some of the pieces they are saying is that I've got enough applications sitting on my robotic arm or an earth mover or even, you know, many use cases in cities where you've got IoT devices and so mm -hmm. on and so forth looking for mm -hmm. applications and waiting for these programmable personas. Person. So yeah. I, I think the ecosystem is there. Uh, yeah. One thing we are a firm believer of, uh, not looking or hunting for a killer app. Yeah. You know, that's, mm -hmm. that's the mistake we always do. Uh, what we need to be thinking about is providing a platform, providing the toolkits back to the developers and let the developers innovate. Yeah. And uh, I think what is critical for us from a communication standpoint, mm -hmm. how do you build up a simple persona of the mm -hmm. network, right? And right. this is where I think the previous speaker talks about a lot of API first and design first philosophies. And, mm -hmm. and anyone who is part of the closer part of the network, network tends to be complex, you know, mm -hmm. any single, network interconnectivity to a radio or to the core of the network uh, tends to have 80 to 100 parameters. And we can't expose those parameters yeah. and it's such a an heavy API. So abstractability is going to be key. Yeah. SDK building is going to be key and this is where we are yeah. putting our head together. Uh, the developer persona and managing the developer, developer experience, experience is going to be key. Yeah, developer providing. experience is going to be a key. But I think that will drive the third party ecosystem. And yeah. some parts of the learning from the CPaaS mm -hmm. players is going to be critical there. And mm -hmm. we can take that chapter and mm -hmm. expand it to other value vectors. Yeah. So absolutely, you know, the ecosystem play is going to be big. Um, a yeah. lot of disruption we are seeing out there and right. uh, yeah. the momentum is building. Yeah, fantastic. And a great points there, Jitin. Yeah. Uh, I, I think you know we've been told for last five minutes, so I think I want to ask one important question. So tell us about the culture. You know, the the how's the API strategy driving the culture internally, right? Uh, maybe you know, the same question to you, to you, Jitin as well. And uh, yeah, yeah. So it's a good question. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things we, you know, because we're in the business of providing technology and financial services uh, through banks and credit unions, we it's what I said in the beginning, right? Uh, what we see in the industry is, um, you know, we don't want people to go to a bank. And th that moment is changing. They want to have financial, so they want to move and manage money where, when, and how they want it. So whether you're, you know, uh, paying for groceries in the grocery store, mm -hmm. um, whether you're in a, a ride share, you know, you, uh, so if you take, take a look at FinTech, uh, it's basically any company that has a financial services experience. Could be a software technology company, could be a bank, could be a merchant, could be an insurance company, could be a, could be a healthcare company. Mm -hmm. As long as there's a money movement in there, you know, they're a, they're a fintech, they've got a fintech persona going on, yeah. right? And so people like us, we want to be able to have that convenience with the fast experience, you know, wherever mm -hmm. we are at. We don't want yeah. to get to think about banking. We just want to be able to manage our money where, when, and when we want it. So, if you think about that, you know, technology is moving fast, but our culture believes that consumer expectations are moving faster than technology, mm -hmm. if you think about that. Correct. So if you think about where innovation is happening, mm -hmm. it's not happening so much in companies like ours, it's happening at the hands of everyday people. Correct. We are creating innovative experiences with what we want, whatever we use to happen. So if you understand that innovation is happening with people in terms of how they are running their lives and what they are demanding, then you have to be able to react at the speed of what they are demanding from right. you. Mm -hmm. So our culture revolves really enabling our clients to help their customers manage their financial services at the speed of their lives. So that's what we believe, right? Yeah. So as long as you can create financial services at the speed of life, yeah. You're doing the right thing. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> totally agree with that point. So you've got to really you know, catch up with uh, the, the, the hands of the people. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, what about you? Maybe with the closing uh, remarks? No, I'm, I, I know I was actually in a yeah. lunch this afternoon and there was a lot of active discussions about, you know, mm -hmm. APIs and API economies and cultures and design practices. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was asking to a colleague, a banking colleague of mine sitting next to me and I was like, you know, I wonder these kind of discussions are happening inside the campuses of AWS and GCP. <laughs> right, and where are the cultures of API first and design first and yeah. SOA architectures? And we know the Jeff Bezos famous blog back in 15 yeah. years back that yeah. led to a 
you know, a culture that needs to be driven. Yeah. The questions that, you know, and, 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 and it's very, very relevant for communications as much as it is for healthcare and banking. We are all three very highly regulated industries. And, yeah. and, and, and at the same time, uh, building software and service-oriented architecture and cloud-native design architectures is not a natural to any one of us. Mm -hmm. So the question here is how do you build cultures into software development and software methodologies where API and API design comes as a first, yeah. right? And, yeah. and this is something that needs to be inculcated not amongst a handful of us, but yeah. all the way to the ground level. And, and you know, some of the pieces that we drive in Nokia now is thou shall not supply a software without yeah. uh, a good versioning of an API or a good catalog of an API because yeah. it's almost a criminal offense to ship right. a software without that, right? And how do you build and inculcate that practice? And that has to be done everywhere. So I think yeah. I think cultures are going to be paramount and that yeah. will define, you know, yeah. you can monetize as much uh, right. as possible if you fix those kind of cultures yeah. from my perspective. Yeah, fantastic, great points. I think, you know, you're seeing this increasing trends, you know, the, the enterprise is becoming a technology company as you rightly said, right? So the mind shift is actually, you know, cloud native. Talk about the cloud. Talk about talking about the standardization, consolidation. Uh, the CIS job is actually currently at consolidation. Let's get the services on board, let the internal services on, and on one single place. So I think you rightly mentioned. Uh, great points. I think uh, we have. I think we have got all the questions. I guess uh, uh, we've got two minutes. Uh, anybody wants to ask any Q and A, some questions to us. Uh, Mehdi is here. I'm Mike sure he will ask a couple of questions. <laughs> I think everyone is ready for drinks, I say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? Are we good? Yeah, cool. Yeah, perfect. So, yeah, thank you very much for uh, this panel. Nice uh, orchestration with the slides and everything. So, we had some feedback there. So, thank you. Thank you.